Good evening. Um, today we're going to discuss probability, which is uh, chapter five in the text. Um, and for practical uh, purposes, in the type of problems we're dealing with, uh, we can consider percentage, proportion, and probability um, as terms we can use interchangeably. So the proportion of diamonds in a deck of cards is 25%, and so is the probability of drawing a diamond from a deck of cards. Um, so uh, it's really a matter of proportions for what we're dealing with in terms of probabilities. <clears throat> So um, probability is the uh, numerical measure that, uh, uh, of the likelihood that an event will occur. And probability values are always assigned on a scale from zero to one. A probability near zero indicates that an event is quite unlikely to occur. A probability near one indicates an event is almost certain to occur. The highest level of uncertainty is 0.5. You're not sure if it's going to occur or not occur. So let's take a look at events and uh, probabilities. So in the social sciences and in management and business administration and economics are social sciences, uh, we deal with uh, questions that don't necessarily have one exact answer. It's not gonna be like in the hard sciences where you ask the question, what is the acceleration of a rock when I drop it here on earth? And the answer is going to be 32 feet per second per second. You'll get the same answer each time you ask that question. In the social sciences, you'll get different uh, answers. And of course, you know, the restaurant quality uh, question is one. How would you rate the quality of your experience here at this restaurant? And sometimes it'll be an excellent, and sometimes it'll be a poor, sometimes it'll be an average, so, but you get a variety of different answers. So by identifying all the possible outcomes that we get, we're identifying the sample space for a random experiment or a question that has many different possible answers. Now, in mathematics, they always go with things like a coin toss or rolling a die, but it's directly analogous to the type of issue that we get when we ask a question like, what was the quality of your service? You're gonna get a variety of different, you're gonna get a range of different possible outcomes. That's gonna be your sample space. And then we'll do a frequency counting on that get percentages, and then we'll be able to look at probabilities. So an event is defined as a collection of outcomes. In statistics, the notion of an experiment, again, differs from that of an experiment in the physical sciences. In statistical experiments, probability determines the outcomes even though the experiment is repeated in exactly the same way, an entirely different outcome may occur. For this reason, statistical experiments are uh, sometimes called random experiments. So here we have uh, the roll uh, of a die, the toss of a coin as mathematical examples of uh, in random experiments and the range of possible outcomes. But let's consider things like conducting a sales call. Was a purchase made or not? Um, reducing the price of a product. Did demand go up, go down, or was there no change in demand? Uh, these are possible outcomes. 
uh, hold a particular share of stock for one year? Did the price go up, go down, or no change? So these are possible outcomes. An experiment is any process that generates well-defined outcomes. The sample space for an experiment is the set of all experimental outcomes. An experimental outcome is also called a sample point. So here's an example. Um, California Power and Light, CPNL, is starting a project and it's designed to increase the generating capacities of one of its plant in Southern California. So they look at similar construction projects and they want to ask the question, what's the completion time going to be on our project? Well, looking at similar construction projects, we get a range of uh, outcomes, eight, nine, 10, 11 and 12 months. So that, we're, again, we're not gonna get 32 feet per second per second like we would in the hard sciences. Here, we're going to get a range of outcomes, a distribution of outcomes that we're going to have to calculate probabilities for. So if looking at that, we find that of the 40 projects we looked at, six of them, were finished in eight months or less, 10, nine months or less, 12, 10 months and less, and so on, giving us a total of 40. So we do, a, we first, we determine the range of possible outcomes. In this case, it's eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 months. Then we do a frequency count. How many times did we get a project that completed in eight months? Well, six times. How many times did we get a project that was completed between eight and nine months? Well, that would be 10. So um, that is where we do our frequency counting. The next is where we create a probability mass function, also known as a relative frequency uh, count. And we take the frequency count and divide it by the total number of occurrences. So the frequency count for each particular value in our range of possible outcomes, we divide that by the total number of outcomes and we get a percentage. So six divided by 40 gives us 15%. So 15% of the time, the project was completed in eight months or less. Likewise, 10 divided by 40 gives us 25%. So 25% of the time, the project was completed in 10 months, uh, I'm sorry, in nine months or less. So the probability of an event is equal to the sum of the probabilities of outcomes for that e event. So let's say that they want to know the um, probability that the project is going to be completed in 10 months or less. So the probability there is going to be the probability that it's completed in eight months or less, plus the probability it's completed between eight and nine months, and plus the probability it's completed in nine uh, and 10 months. So we go back and we look at the uh, relative frequency count and we get 15% plus 25% plus 30%. So 70% of the time projects were completed before 10 months. So we can tell management there is a 70% probability the project will be completed in 10 months or less. The probability assigned to each experimental outcome must, between, uh, must be between zero and one inclusively, and the sum of all the probabilities for all experimental outcomes must equal one. That's 100%. One is the same as 100%. Okay, let's look at some of the uh, basic relationships of probability. So the complement of an event A is going to be all the outcomes that are not in A. So, you know, if 
A is we want to know the probability of the project being completed in 10 months or less. The complement of A is the probability that it's going to take more than 10 months. Um, and the complement of A is defined to be the event consisting of all outcomes that are not in A. So here we have a Venn diagram and we see a blue uh, rectangle with, that represents our sample space. We have a, a white circle that uh, represents event A and then the blue in the rectangle represents the complement of A. So, um, either an event A or its complement must occur. So, since we know that uh, the sum of all probabilities must equal 100%, we can uh, compute the probability of uh, A, if we know the complement of A, as probability of A equals 1 minus the probability of the complement of A. Uh, the, additional, the addition law provides a way to compute the probability of event A or B or both A and B uh, occurring. This is um, known as the union of events. So given two events, uh, A, oops, A and B, the union of A and B uh, is defined as the event containing all outcomes belonging to A or B or both. So if we have our sample space again represented by the rectangle, uh, the two circles, event A and event B, um, represent uh, the uh, probabilities that event A is going to occur and the probability that event B is going to occur. And then the addition of them is going to be, the union of them is going to be the probabilities that A and B uh, both occur. So the definition of the intersection of A and B is the event containing the outcomes that belong to both A and B. So here's the intersection we were looking at before, the union of A events A and B. Here we're looking at the intersection. Here the blue represents something where A and B both occur. So the addition law provides a way to compute the probability that event A or event B will occur. Um, and the way we do that is we are, are going to add the probability of A plus the probability of B, but we have to subtract the intersection of A and B to avoid double counting. So let's, let's take a look. So here we have event A and event B. So if we add the probability of event A to the probability of event B, this section where they both have uh, values in common will be double counted. That's why we subtract this from our uh, equation and we get back to the probability of the union of A and B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B both occurring. Now, there's a special case when A and B are mutually exclusive events. In other words, they have no events or outcomes in common. And on a Venn diagram, it would look like this. So here's the probability of A and here's the probability of B. There's no overlap, so there would not be any double counting if we uh, added the probability of A to the probability of B. So 
So for mutually exclusive events, the probability of A or the probability of B occurring is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. Now let's take a look at conditional probability. So conditional probability is um, when the probability of one event is dependent on whether some related event has occurred. So we often use this when we have indicators and we're looking for indicators to let us know the probability of some future event. And oftentimes we'll use conditional probabilities in calculating the probability of that future event. So if we uh, have a, an, an illustration example, um, Lancaster Savings and Loan, they're interested in a mortgage uh, default risk, and they're interested in whether the probability of a, a customer defaulting on a loan differs by their marital status. So uh, let's take a look at this case, and I've got I'll have I'll bring the data set up right now. So here we have the uh, uh, mortgage loan database of, uh, what was the name of that company? Um, Lancaster Savings and Loan. So Lancaster Savings and Loan, we have the history of all their uh, mortgage uh, information, and we have you know, the marital status, uh, annual income, mortgage amount, so on and so forth. Um, as well as if they defaulted on the mortgage or not. So what we want to do is um, find out the probability of them, of a customer defaulting on the loan, given that they're married, and the probability of a customer defaulting on a loan, given that they're single. So we're going to be subtotaling on the number of defaults for singles, the number of defaults for marrieds, and then the number that did not default for singles and the number that did not default for marrieds. So that's going to be a pivot table. So let's go ahead, go up to insert. We'll go over and insert a, a pivot table. We're happy with that range. And so I'm going to drag marital status to rows because we want to, that's how we want to subtotal it. Uh, we want to get what's the count of defaults by married, what's the count of defaults by singles. Now, the other thing we need to know is the defaults. So I'll carry uh, default on mortgage over to the columns. And then we just got to get a count. So we'll count up the customer. Uh, number field. And again, uh, w this goes back to the first things we do is frequency counting. So now we can see uh, in terms of raw data, but we may want to know, um, you know, the percentage uh, of marrieds who default and the percentage of singles who default. So we can come down and change this from a raw count to a uh, relative frequency count, a probability mass function, and we'll do a percentage of row total. So now we get the percentages of row totals. So the probability that you default, given that you're single, we come over to the row for default. Yes, we did default. I'm sorry, we come over to the column, yes, yes, we did default. And we go over to the row single and their intersection is right here. So the probability that you would default given that you were single is 26.1%. On the other hand, the probability that you would default given that you're married, so we come over to the uh, column yes for uh, probability of default. The row is going to be married. The probability that you're going to default given that you're married 
is 55%. So um, this is how we can uh, use uh, pivot tables to uh, deal with probability uh, type questions, especially conditional probability uh, type questions. <clears throat> Okay, let's go back to the lecture. Okay, so here we are. Um, so when values are giving uh, the probabilities of the intersection of two events, they're known as joint probabilities. So we were looking at 20 uh, 6 percent and 55 percent as joint probabilities, the intersections of two dimensions or two events. Marginal probabilities are founded by summing the joint probabilities in the corresponding row or column uh, of the probability table that we create, the pivot table that we create. And conditional probabilities can be computed as the ratio of the joint probability to the marginal probability. So the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. And we can reverse that and it's true as well. <clears throat> so if the probability on a, of an event D is not changed by the existence of another uh, marital status. So let's say the probability of defaulting is not changed by the uh, existence of, a, of being married. Then we would say events D and M are independent events and we could calculate the probability of uh, A given B is just equal to the probability of A. And of course in reverse as well. So the multiplication law is where we just multiply this through by the probability of B. And we get this. So the probability of A and B occurring is equal to the probability of B times the probability that A occurs given that B did occur. So this is known as the uh, multiplication law, and it's the probability of two events happening. It's an and. A happens and B happens. So remember, the addition law was for um, an or. Event A happens or event B happens or both. And of course, there's a special case uh, when the events A and B are independent, and then we don't have to do the conditional probability because uh, if they're independent, the probability of uh, B happening give, given that A happens is uh, not going to have any meaning. And in that case, we just multiply probability of A times the probability of B. So, um, several hundred years ago, a uh, uh, reverend in England came up with uh, a, what he called Bayes, what has been called Bayes' theorem, um, and it's used uh, for calculating uh, future probabilities using conditional probability uh, theory that we just went over. So what you have is you have an initial probability that something will happen. And again, we're looking at this in terms of proportions or percentages based on histories, or we have some uh, logic that ties it to an, a mathematical analytic distribution, but we have this prior probability estimate. Then new information comes in, and then we want to find out what the probability is um, based on this new information. And that's known as the posterior. 
So um, let's consider an example. Um, a Bayesian is a conditional probability, the probability of A given B. The computation of the probability of B given that A happens. Um, so uh, we might consider something like spam. So we compute the proportion of spam with an indicator word. Um, and then we find the proportion of email that is spam. Then we can predict if an email with the predictor word is spam. So let's say, and, and this actually uh, is actually a serious uh, issue because uh, most uh, commercial email systems try and limit the amount of spam that comes into your mailbox. And they do that by using spam filters. So there's actually sites that have a list of, okay, here's um, a letter, here's emails with spam in them, here's emails that are not spam. And analysis is done on those. So assume that some emails might be spam and you want to develop some sort of filter to uh, automatically move them to a junk folder. So you might consider if you have words like Viagra or like authentic Rolex, uh, these words might be a tip off to you that it is a spam email. So we could look at um, developing a model uh, for both spam and non-spam and note the percentage of emails in each that contains such words. So we, again, we go to these sites, we have spam emails, we have non-spam emails. So what we would do is we would just calculate up the um, percentage of times in the spam that uh, words like Viagra and authentic Rolex showed up, and then we go to the non-spam and calculate the number of times those show up. So let's say in our case, we, we do that. And if we take the example of Viagra and we find that 50% of spam emails contain that word, but only 1% of non-spam email contains it, then we can calculate the uh, probability an email is spam if it contains the word Viagra. And we actually use the Bayesian formula that you see here. And uh, just to substitute in, um, the probability of spam, given that it is uh, Viagra in the email, is going to be equal to the uh, probability of uh, having uh, an email with Viagra be spam, and that's 50%, divided by the probability of an email being uh, having Viagra if it's spam, that's again 50%, plus the probability of an email being uh, having uh, Viagra given that it is not spam, and that we said was 1%. So we are dividing 0.5 by 0.5 plus 0.01, and that's going to be 0.5 divided by 0.51, or 98% of messages with Viagra are spam. So there's a 98% probability that uh, we have uh, a spam email if we have the word Viagra. And here we see a kind of a tree diagram that explains uh, how this is actually accomplished. Um, and then you have the conditional probabilities uh, multiplied through. And uh, of course, this is uh, a different example. It's the two supplier example rather than the spam email example. Uh, Bayes theorem is applicable for events uh, for which we want to uh, calculate uh, posterior probabilities, um, but the assumption is they're mutually exclusive. So that's why 
this is usually called naive Bayes because uh, there's this naive assumption that uh, the events are all mutually exclusive and uh, also that their union is the entire sample space. So here's a more generalized example of uh, Bayesian probabilities. Okay, let's now uh, turn our attention to random variables. Random variables are quantities whose values are not known with certainty. Uh, a random variable is a numerical description of the outcome of a random experiment. So there's two types. There's discrete, where we're counting how many. This is going to be integer. Um, natural numbers. Uh, we also have continuous, how much. This is going to be real numbers. You're going to have uh, a lot of gradation between the integers, 1.1, 1.11, 1.001, you know, and so on. So uh, discrete random variables take only on specify discrete values. So there's a small number of values uh, that they uh, potentially could take on. If you get, in, oftentimes in business, you'll have a discrete variable, but it has so many uh, possible outcomes, it's treated as though it's uh, a continuous variable. Not mathematically exact, but it's uh, just the difference isn't gonna uh, amount to much. Uh, so it's treated as a continuous variable in that type of space. Well, so in business, we're looking at discrete random variables as having a limited number of discrete values. So here, again, we have um, the uh, possible uh, outcomes for discrete random variables. So the number of patients who arrive in a given time period, that might be uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, up maybe 15, something like that. Um, and then you contact five customers. How many of them are going to buy from you? Well, it could be 0 through 5. So again, a limited number of possible outcomes. Um, offer a customer a choice of two products, and then the product chosen by the customer. Um, a couple of out three outcomes there. Uh, they didn't choose any, they chose one or they chose the other. Okay, let's take a look at a demo for this. So I'll go ahead and open up our Lancaster mortgage. So here's the um, mortgage analysis we uh, just finished a couple of minutes ago. Let's look at this in a different light. So instead of a percentage of row total, I'll click the down arrow of count customers. I'm going to change that to a percentage of grand total. So now, when we uh, see this, what we have is uh, the, the table we were uh, looking at in uh, the lecture uh, that was um, in its table 5-5 in the book. And we get the uh, uh, joint probabilities and the margin probabilities for uh, each of the uh, different possible combinations. So let's keep this in mind. Then we're going to go look at the joint probability table in the next slide. But this is how we would get it. Um, again, we make our pivot table just as we did before. But instead of looking at a percentage of row total We'll just look at a percentage of grand total here. And now let's go back to our lectures.
And here's the joint probability table. So again, this is where we're going to uh, take each one of the frequency counts for the intersections, and we're going to divide by grand totals. And then we get the joint probability table that we see here. The other type of random variable is a continuous random variable. So um, we assume any numerical value in an interval or collection of intervals is a continuous random variable. So um, obviously in the business world, few variables are truly continuous, but uh, many discrete random variables have a large number of potential outcomes, so they can effectively be modeled as a continuous variable. So um, some of the examples of continuous random variables. Um, so look at, um, we fill a soft drink can uh, to uh, its you know, a capacity according to our uh, production line. And we want to know the possible range of values. Well, obviously, it's going to be discrete, but for our purposes, we're just going to consider it continuous. It could have zero all the way up to 12.1 uh, ounces. Um, uh, invest 10,000 in the stock market. Uh, the, what's the value of the investment after one year? Well, again, uh, it's going to have many different potential discrete possibilities, but we just consider it continuous for x greater than zero uh, for uh, purposes here. Okay, so let's take a look at Lancaster mortgage data again. So, here we're back in the raw data, and I just highlighted total amount paid uh, as an example of a discrete variable that uh, is uh, going to be treated as a continuous variable. Um, but let's take a look. I mean, uh, we'll go ahead and do an insert. We could treat it either way, but um, if we do decide to treat it as a uh, discrete, we'd probably use binning. So let's, let's come over. Uh, if we do it just as a raw discrete bar chart, you can see we've got um, a vast multitude of values and frequency counts, and this isn't going to be uh, readily uh, useful to management. So let's instead look at the type of charts they recommend. So here is a line chart, which is used for continuous data. So again, that's uh, something where Excel is saying, you've got so many uh, discrete values in this uh, selection that we should probably treat it as a continuous variable. But let's go ahead and it also will let us use a uh, bar chart, which is uh, more appropriate for discrete variables, but look what it did. It binned things together. So we can take a look by uh, uh, right-clicking the x-axis and go down to Format Axis. And we can see here that, in fact, it did bin it for us, and it binned it at every 100,000. So it calculated the um, range of the, the numbers, you know, let's say whatever it was, zero to um, uh, 170 million or 100, whatever it was. And then they uh, calculated out, okay, probably best bin size is gonna be 100,000. So they just lumped the uh, discrete categories together. Okay, zero to 100,000 goes into bin one, 100 to 200,000 into bin two, and so on. And the idea here is uh, this is a, a discrete variable with a large, large number of possible values. So we can treat it as a discrete variable, but it will really only be useful if we use binning. We 
take the large number we have and we kind of fit them into bin sizes and then we deal with the bin sizes or we can deal with the uh, continuous nature of it with a graph that's more appropriate for something that's continuous which is what of course uh, was the first thing that was uh, displayed uh, by the recommended uh, graph for uh, from Excel. Okay, 